All right, so um, we read Hebrews 11, talks a lot about faith, obviously. Um, the title of my sermon is actually Pleasing God. And basically, I'm going to try and explain what are the best ways that we can please God. Because, you know, our Christian life, there's, there, there's a lot of things we can do and there's a lot of things that we can't do. And, you know, sometimes they need to be cleared up or we just need to be reminded of things that, that God wants us to do, even on a daily basis, in order to please Him. Um, so I decided to read Hebrews 11 for the the fact that that it mostly talks about faith now if you look at uh hebrews 11 the first verse it says now faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen so you know my, my the first question is is well what is faith well we have a definition now faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen it's it's not something that you can hold it's not tangible it's not there we our faith is something that we hope for and that we believe in just like we believe on Jesus Christ for our salvation he's the one that paid for our sins and we believe that he's going to literally take our soul to heaven when we die and and the reason for that is, is because it's written in the Bible that we have the gift of eternal life. So it lasts forever. No matter what, like, yes, our physical body will, will perish uh, because it's sinful. But once that happens, we are going to end up in heaven. And that's, you know, and that requires faith. There's no, like, uh, we'll go door to door. We'll talk to people about, you know, believing and how easy it is to believe on Jesus Christ. To, to go to heaven because we don't want anybody to go to hell. But, but the fact is, is I can't literally prove it to you by showing you like on a piece of paper mathematically that, that that's going to happen. You, the, the biggest part of that is believing and having faith in order to believe that you're going to receive the free gift. Now, the other thing that the, the chapter uh, and, and, you know, throughout the whole chapter, that, that's all basically, for probably 80% of the chapter, is talking about all these different examples of, of figures in the Bible that had faith in God. You know, um, Abraham and Moses and Sarah. Turn to Genesis chapter 22. Now, I just want to, I, I want to kind of, you know, because there's a lot of examples in this chapter about faith and, 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 and how these different figures applied their faith with God. Um, I, I just kind of want to want to dissect just one example. Uh, and that one is uh, starting in uh, verse number 17 in Hebrews 11. It says, by faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. So in Genesis chapter 22, we actually have the, the, the story because in Hebrews we're recounting what happened in uh, Genesis. All right, so starting in verse 1, we'll just read a little bit here. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah. And offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. 
excuse me. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they both went and they went both of them together and Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said my father and he said here am I my son and he said behold the fire and the wood but where is the lamb for a burnt offering and Abraham said my son God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering so they went both of them together and they came to the place which God had told them of, and Abraham built an altar there, and laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand, and took the knife to slay him. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven, and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. So, we have the story of Abraham. God says, Take your son, your only begotten son, Isaac, the, the son of promise, that you, I'm going to build a great nation out of, and... Go and offer him up as a burnt offering. Now, some of us have kids here. I have a younger brother. We've all kind of had younger children in our lives. If you could only imagine having one son and God telling you to offer him up as a, a sacrifice. I mean, uh, I would be pretty devastated. Uh, you know, like... I. I you know, I don't know what I would do in that situation, but I know what Abraham did, and he didn't even hesitate. He said, okay. And let, let's take a look at um, why. Why, you know, like, obviously Abraham had faith. That's the whole point. He had faith that God would even bring back Isaac from the dead. And we see that here in, um, back in Hebrews 11, Chapter or chapter 11, uh, verse number 19, it says, Accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. By uh, so, Abraham had so much faith in God that he knew that even if he were to slay Isaac, that, that God would raise him from the dead. And obviously, with Jesus Christ, we saw Jesus bring back people to life more than one time. I mean, the most famous being Lazarus. Um, so, and, and Lazarus was dead for four days before Jesus actually raised him from the dead. So, God is capable of doing anything. There's nothing beyond God. There's nothing that God cannot do. And, you know, faith is the first way that we can please God and show our, our faith and show our um, submission and our, and our de devotion to, to God. Um, so what, what, what do people think of as, as pleasing God in, in the world you know a lot a lot of people you hear a lot of things out there I mean most people think you know like if if I'm making a lot of money and I'm uh, donating it or doing the right thing with my money then th there's nothing wrong with me actually having a lot of money um, a lot of people believe that helping the community grow and, and helping others is uh, pleasing God. And, and, it, and, it, and it is. You know, God wants us to help in the community. God wants us to minister unto others. And, but, but some of the things that, that people think of as pleasing God can get a little ridiculous. Like, a lot of people say, well, God is a loving God and He loves everyone and no matter what, everyone's going to heaven. It doesn't matter. As long as you're trying, you're really trying in your heart to be a good person, you know, God is going to accept you into heaven because you, you at least had the right heart. You know, they, they completely 
dismiss the fact that 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 they're a sinner and that their sins are actually getting them to hell and the only way to get to heaven is through Jesus Christ so look at Hebrews chapter 11 verse number 6 Verse number six says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So, I mean, it, it's, it doesn't get any more plain than that. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. You cannot please him without having faith. And, and if you think about it, you know, Believing on His Son is the first step to having the faith that God wants and pleasing Him in the right way. Because again, without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he, he that cometh to God must believe that He is, so you have to believe that God exists, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. So another thing that goes along with pleasing God is... You should be diligently seeking Him. Diligently means like, I mean, you're focused on Him a lot. You know, we focus on our children a lot. We focus on our family a lot. God should be number one in our life. And the, I mean, it, it, that, that's it. You must, you, you must believe in the right God. Too. The, a lot of people think, well, you know, if, if, if I'm doing the right thing, then I have the right God. Like, for example, the Mormons or the Jehovah's Witnesses, they, they don't have the right God. Uh, Islam, you know, the Muslims, they don't have the right God. They're believing on men's traditions and, and, and work and works in order to get to heaven. And, and the Bible says, you know, the most famous verse in the Bible, John chapter 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Also, if you turn to Ephesians, um, Ephesians chapter number 2, it's before Hebrews, Ephesians chapter number 2, verse 8 and 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So, you know, this is a great um, soul winning verse I use all the time. Because, um, you know, you'll, you'll talk to a, a Mormon or Jehovah's Witness, and the first thing... Well, the first thing the Mormon tells you is that faith without works is dead. And, you know, that's a whole other sermon. James 2 says, yes, it does say that faith without works is dead, but it's not talking about salvation. It's about us showing outwardly that we have faith by doing the works. Now, you've got to read the chapter in context. You can't just pull one verse out, obviously. But even if you, you know, and that's the other thing is, 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 the Mormons specifically believe that they, they say they believe everything that's in the King James Version of the Bible, but they don't. They, they don't believe that it's not of works. They believe that they have to work continually to, to stay in God's grace, or however they phrase it. I'm not really sure. Um, so, probably the most... First and most important thing to pleasing God is you want to have faith. Second most important thing is you want to make sure that you're seeking God diligently. Now, what are some examples of, of seeking God diligently? Well, the first one I can think of is to keep God's commandments. Now, why should we keep God's commandments. Let's, um, let's turn to Ecclesiastes chapter number 12.
Ecclesiastes chapter number 12. Look at verse number 13. It says, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. So, keeping God's commandments is the whole duty of man. I mean, it says it right there. A lot of people, you know, especially worldly people, well, are always like contemplating, well, what is the purpose of life and, and why are we even here? You know, then they go into crazy things like aliens and, and, and all these creative ideas that people have about, about our purpose, you know, and, 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 and all of it's just wrong. I mean, the, the Bible is clear about what God wants us to do and the we're here to, to, to please God. And the way that we do that is by keeping His commandments. That is our whole duty as humans. So, if you want to be happy and you want to have a good and blessed life, just do what the verse says. Fear God and keep His commandments and God will make sure that you're rewarded accordingly. Because, like it said in Hebrews 11, he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Now, you could say, well, I don't really know all the commandments. You know, I mean, we have the Ten Commandments, but those aren't obviously the only commandments. There's a lot more. And, and the way you can learn the commandments is, A, by reading your Bible diligently, and B, coming to church as often as you can. Um, Obviously, in church, I would say I learn the most as far as like studying and dissecting things. Um, other than literally preaching, um, preaching a, a sermon, there's a lot of study that's involved in actually preaching a sermon. But you know, you don't you don't have to do that. The, that's the pastor's job. Pastor has to study the the, the Bible, figure out what it says. Make sure that the message is clear and that, that, that it is, in fact, what the Bible says. And all you need to do is show up to church and listen and, and really apply. It's not, it's not just good enough to listen to what, what the, the pastor is preaching or saying. It, the important part comes in applying everything that you hear. So turn to uh, 2 Timothy 2. Well, here, let me see here. Actually, turn to Hebrews 10 first. Since, I, since I'm on the whole church thing, let's do that first. And I'll, I'll show you what the Bible says about that. Hebrews 10, verse number 24. It says, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. Very famous verse. Um, you know, I'm sure if you've been coming to the church, you know, for a certain amount of time, you've heard that verse before, or maybe you've read it, obviously. Um, but... The reason that it's so important to come to church, A, you're going to learn a lot, but B, it's so that we can provoke one another unto love and to, to good works. So, you know, coming to church and, and fellowshipping and, and helping one another out, one another out and, and, and helping your brothers and sisters. These are, these are good works. These are things that please God. God wants us to do good works for Him. Obviously, that's not a part of our salvation. That's completely separate. But once you get saved, that's the next step. Is you want to do the good works. You have to have faith. You want to please God. One great way to do that is to come to church. Fellowship. 
you know, get involved in the church. Do, you know, do things. Our church is kind of small now, but, you know, we have games and activities and, and we have the Halloween party or not non-Halloween party coming up. Um, so get involved, you know, come hang out. It's, it, we're like a, we're like a family here. We want to, we want, God wants us to be like a little family and, and help, help one another out. And, and ultimately that is something that that's pleasing to God. Now, if you turn to us now, turn to second, Timothy two fifteen, because the, the first thing I had mentioned, um, is, is, is to learn the Bible, read the Bible, get more familiar with it, uh, study it. Well, I'm going to show you why. Let's see here. Second Timothy. Second Timothy two, chapter number two, verse number fifteen. It says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So we know that the Bible is the word of truth. Uh, Jesus is the word. Jesus said, I am the way, the the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. You know, in order to know Jesus, to know God, we need to show our study and, and show ourselves approved unto God. And, and the way we can do that is by reading our Bible. The more we're familiar with the Bible, the more we know the stories, the more we get familiar with, um, you know, the truth. The truth and what's righteous in, in God's eye. Uh, another way that we can please God is to learn how to win souls to Christ. Obviously, God wants all of us to be saved and all of us to go to heaven. And it is our, it's, it's, it's another one of our duties to, uh, you know, as, as, as a Christian, is to win souls. If you turn to Mark chapter 16, verse number 15, Mark 16, 15. This is Jesus speaking. He says, and he, and he said unto them, Go ye into all the word, world, and preach the gospel to every creature. Likewise, in Proverbs uh, chapter number 11, verse 30, it says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. So if you want to be wise and you want to please God, you know, and please Jesus, go, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And, you know, I mean, that means everyone. That means when you're, when you're out talking to people uh, at the store, we should, we should be constantly thinking about God. And, and I, you know, I need to do this myself more. Just preach the word. Ask people if they go to church. You know, that's like the, the, the best icebreaker. I mean, you can have any conversation and then just like throw in, well, do you go to church anywhere? And it's almost like a new starting point. It's a good segue and a good starting point to continue the conversation. So the people that we meet in our lives is, is uh, you know, they're, we go door to door preaching the word, but there's also people that we do meet on a daily basis and we interact with and and it's important to you know if you really care about these people you're gonna you know preach the gospel to them make sure that they're saved and they know where they're going when they die it's important uh, okay and then turn to Galatians chapter number five
Another way that we can please God is by walking in the Spirit. Um, you know, daily we have this battle of, of the flesh versus the Spirit, and we're constantly battling with the flesh to make sure that we're doing the right thing and, and, and pleasing God. Uh, in Galatians, let's read a little bit here in Galatians 5, starting in chapter number, or verse number 16 says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one, the one to the other. So that, excuse me, ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murder, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in the time in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. So once we get saved, we get the Holy Ghost. We get the Spirit reborn in us. And from that point on, you know, we don't automatically become this, you know, perfect Christian that does everything right. It's, it's, it's definitely a process. We're, we're a young child at that point, and we need to learn how to grow and please God more. And, and the way we can do that is by... Another way we can do that is by walking in the Spirit. Now, in the beginning here of Galatians 5, or uh, uh, starting in the beginning of where I read, verse 16, it says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So when you're walking in the Spirit, you're not fulfilling the lust of the flesh. And likewise, when you're walking in the flesh, you're not fulfilling the Spirit. So... It's obviously, obviously God wants us to walk in the Spirit. We still have this fleshly body that causes us to sin. But, you know, have faith, you know, that, that, that God will teach us and guide us in the right direction so that we can learn how to please Him more. And, and just look, if, if you're in the Spirit, you're going to... What's the word I'm looking for here? You're going to have the fruit of the Spirit. So you're going to bear fruit. When you're in the Spirit, you're going to bear fruit. And that fruit is going to be love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. And then against those, there, are, there, is, no, there is no law. So one of, one of the things that will manifest from you being in the Spirit is more faith, which in turn pleases God more, and therefore we are doing more of what God wants, which is pleasing Him and, and walking in the Spirit in general. So, keeping the commandments, learning your Bible, coming to church, you know, learning how to soul win, soul winning more, and walking in the Spirit, these are all great examples of how we can all uh, please God Please God more. And, and why, should, why, should we, why should we do all of these things in order to please God? Well, it will, show, it will show our reliance on Him and that we need Him. God wants us to, to need Him. Just like a child needs his mother and his father in order to support them and love them and nourish them and help them grow. God wants the same thing from us. He wants us to be His children. And we are His children once we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior. But at the same time, we need to show our reliance on God. We have to remember 
Um, and we and and you know, with that, we have to remember that God will not tempt us beyond our limits. Um, we have to have faith that whatever he he throws at us, he already knows we can handle it. Um, look, if you would, at First Corinthians uh, chapter number ten. Verse number 13. It says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it so god knows god knows everything he knows the exact situation you're in exactly what you're going through from a day-to-day -day basis he already knows what you're gonna do look he's not gonna god loves us he we have to have faith in god that he's not going to put us through something that he knows we can't handle um, he's always going to let us give us a way to escape so that we can bear it. So it's, it's important to remember because a lot of times we forget, you know, we get wrapped up in the things of this world. We, 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 we don't walk in the spirit so much and we forget that God, you know, God is a loving God. He's our father. And, and, you know, if we're pleasing him, he's, he, he's going to do that much more to make our lives better and easier and when he does tempt us it's because he wants us to grow and become a better person and live more for him essentially now I've been talking a lot about things that we can do in order to please God which are important you know you want to know the, the steps you need to take in order to please God. But there are also things that you, you know, you, you don't want to do things that are going to anger God also. You know, like, obviously we don't want to sin. We want to eliminate all the sin in our lives that, that we can and, and, you know, and, and diligently try to seek Him by not doing the things that, that He doesn't want us to do. One of those things is... Um, well, turn uh, to chapter 5 in 1 Corinthians. We're in 1 Corinthians right now. I'll read it for you. First Corinthians 5, verse number 11 says, But now... I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such and one know not to eat. So if any man call himself a brother, somebody that's been going to church, who's, who's you know, saying that, that, that they're reading their Bible and, and diligently seeking the Lord and pleasing them, if, if, if this brother or sister is a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or railer, drunkard, extortioner, don't, don't even eat with them. That's, that's, what, that's how bad it is, you know. You don't want to be on this list of things if, if, if you're trying to please God and, and do the right thing for Him. So, just something to be aware of. You know, these are the kinds of things that should be rebuked. Um, and, you know, hopefully whoever is doing these things is, is you know, will we'll turn around and, 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 and come back and, and do the right works for God. Now... Another thing that you don't want to do is, and, and this is my last point here, go to Revelations chapter number 3.
Revelations chapter number 3, verse 14 says, And unto the angel of the church of Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Now, it's obvious. God doesn't want us to be lukewarm. He'd rather you be cold. Just live in the flesh the whole time. Then, then, then you know, go around making it look like you're living this um, spiritual life and, and, and doing the right thing and making sure and, and pretty much having this outward appearance of, you know, I am pleasing God. And showing people, but really, you're just lukewarm. You don't want to be lukewarm. Think about a time when you've eaten something like really nasty, and the first thing that came to your mind, you didn't even think about it, you just spit it out. I'm sure you've had it before. I've had it plenty of times. You know, like that, that is the way God's looking at you when you're lukewarm. Don't be lukewarm. Be, be hot. Let's, let's be hot. Let's strive to be hot in the church. Um, and, and let's fellowship and let's try to do the best that we can to, to please God and do the things that, that he, he deems right. All right, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for, for this time we've had um, to listen to your word and to, to read the Bible. And I pray that, that we can all be more diligent to, to, to please you and have more faith and, and, and do all the right things that, that, that are in your eyes so that, that we can become closer to you. Uh, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.